Hi, welcome. My name is Sam Sachs. I'm a Cyber Fellow at New America and a Senior Fellow at the Yale Law School Paul Tai China Center. I'm thrilled today to be joined by David Gosset, who's a partner with the Technology Privacy and Security Group at Davis Wright Tremaine. He's also been a litigator in the WeChat case. And Jen Daskal, who is professor and faculty director at the Tech Law and Security Program at American University College, Washington College of Law, and is also this year a fellow with us at New America, where she's working on a very exciting project, which Jen, I may put you on the spot and have you talk a little bit about that today as well. Um, unfortunately, James Mulvenon could not join us. He has a very sick golden retriever. So we are all gonna do our best to channel the national security perspective from James here in the conversation. Um, so before we get started, just very briefly to recap where we've been, I think it's been a dizzying few weeks and months looking at the August executive order ban in which the president declared a national emergency to ban TikTok and WeChat. We also have an ongoing CFIUS review, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment um, in the United States investigation into the national security risks. Um, of the foreign acquisition piece of this deal, of, of the ByteDance acquisition of TikTok. And simultaneously, we have trickling through the system um, lawsuits, which David Gossett has been on the front lines of it, can talk with us about. And I think what's at stake here is we're talking about privacy, we're talking about cybersecurity, um, free uh, speech, um, and the future of the global internet, not to mention US-China relations and tech competition among two great powers. So let's get started, and I want to turn it over to David first. David, get us up to speed on where we are with the lawsuits, um, both WeChat and TikTok. And I will say, although we are talking about TikTok and WeChat as a package today, these also are very distinct sets of issues. Um, and we'll do our best as well to be specific about what's at play in each of these distinct sort of landscapes as well. But David, let's kick us off and get us up to speed on how to think about what the lawsuits mean, what comes next. Delighted to, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to uh, join you today. Um, as Sam said, uh, on uh, August 6th, the president issued these two executive orders, one um, banning uh, in sort of not entirely well-defined terms, uh, TikTok, one banning in not entirely well-defined terms, but more or less identical to the other one, uh, WeChat. Uh, one, one slight correction I'll make to what Sam said is, these didn't declare a national emergency. These both were issued um, uh, pursuant to the national emergency uh, the president declared back in May 2019 um, on the ICTS supply chain, the, the Information and Communications Technology and Services supply chain. He declared that national emergency uh, 14 months before. And most of the discussion had after that declaration been about Huawei and other companies that deal with internet backbone technology, and we can get into that. But in any event, um, fast forward to August 2020, and he says, I'm banning TikTok and WeChat. Uh, and we'll get into various reasons he might or might not have done that. Uh, in those um, two executive orders, he said, these take effect in 45 days, September 20th. Uh, and before September 20th, the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, will issue some form of identification clarifying what is actually being banned by the executive orders. It also says that um, they can enforce the bans without advance warning, so it's a little ambiguous from exactly what, how that was likely to play out, which um, worried people. In any event, uh, this happened back in August, and you, the, the companies and users of these apps got quite worried. Uh, and in, in fact, there are at this point four separate lawsuits that I'm going to briefly note. Um, uh, I represent the plaintiffs in a, the, the only lawsuit about WeChat, which is the U.S. WeChat Users Alliance uh, versus Trump and Ross. Uh, this was a lawsuit brought by an association of um, American or sort of U.S.-based users of WeChat, mostly Chinese American uh, businesses and individuals who use and rely on WeChat and sued because it was go they thought it was uh, the executive order was invalid and would uh, block their use of the device, block their speech, block their communication with their relatives and others, et cetera, et cetera. Then there are three separate lawsuits about TikTok. Um, 
in basically the order in which they were filed, uh, a TikTok employee uh, named Patrick Ryan, who I believe said, told me uh, via chat that he's going to be here today. So hi, Patrick, if you're in fact on, uh, uh, sued uh, in the Northern District of California. Uh, and um, because he was concerned that transactions involving we, uh, TikTok would involve, include paying the employees of TikTok. And he and the other employees were might very well, as of September 20th, not be able to even get paid. Um, then a group, and so, and Patrick sought a, a injunction barring the, the uh, enforcement of the um, TikTok executive order, and the judge denied it largely because the, he, he, the, the government represented that they weren't going to block uh, salaries and such. Uh, TikTok creators have sued uh, in Pennsylvania, that's the Marland case. Uh, they Really rely on it both for expressive purposes and many people actually essentially use it as a form of making a living uh, and have sued to say you should block TikTok. And then um, most recently, TikTok itself, ByteDance, I think is technically the plaintiff, which is the TikTok corporate owner, has sued in um, the District of Columbia District Court and is also trying to get the, the um, injunction, the sort of executor is blocked at least temporarily. All of these are still on, uh, sort of ongoing. We, in the WeChat case on Sunday, so hours before the executive order was going to take effect, got a preliminary injunction barring the implementation of that executive order. And um, that litigation is progressing at light speed, sort of both light speed and very slowly. So um, late last night, the government filed a, a motion asking for that injunction to be stayed. So essentially for the the executive order to be able to take effect, the ban on WeChat to be able to take effect um, instantly. Uh, and we are starting this uh, bracket all this morning, have been working on sort of proposing that. Uh, then the, the TikTok executive order was delayed. The, there is a, at the moment, there is a ban, by, there will be a ban as of Sunday at midnight for new downloads of TikTok. And the actual use of TikTok won't be banned until November. This is tied into the potential sale of TikTok. Um, the judge in the TikTok creators lawsuit is hearing a briefing right now on whether to enjoin even the ban on downloads. Uh, the plaintiffs in that case have a brief due at five o'clock today, and the judge has promised to rule before the injunction would take effect. Uh, similarly, in the, the newest lawsuit, the TikTok own lawsuit, uh, Judge Nichols here in DC has ordered the government by 2.30 today either to oppose the uh, injunction or to extend the ban on new downloads of TikTok so that he can, they can take more time to, to discuss whether or not that's true. So that's a, a quick summary of, of the procedural posture. Basically, right now, nothing is banned. TikTok could be banned, uh, downloads of TikTok could be banned as of Sunday. Um, everything else depends on judges at least until November. Got it. I mean, one of the hottest topics of conversation, I think, has been around, you know, are, do existing users, and for WeChat and, and TikTok, what happens with existing users if you already have it on your phone? Is this just going to, is this just going to impact software updates? And then there's been the whole extraterritorial question of, does the term transaction extend beyond the border of the US, which it seems like at least with the most latest development, it sounds like it does not. Is that correct? Yeah, so there are a couple of questions in there. So let's put aside new downloads of the app or updates to the app, because those clearly are banned. Then there, there as you say, what, what is actually banned by the, the uh, under the Secretary of Commerce's identifications, as they, they keep calling them, uh, is essentially corporate transactions with uh, Tencent and ByteDance, with the, the owners of WeChat and TikTok. So um, internet service providers aren't allowed to do business with these companies. Content distribution networks aren't allowed to do business with these with these companies. Um, various other technical aspects of contracting to keep the app running smoothly are banned. Um, and as you say, there is a real dispute, a, a real sort of unknown as to whether the what that will mean is that if those bans were to take effect, 
the app would work less less well, things would be slowed down, um, some content might not go through smoothly, things like that, or if it would actually just be a, it's shut down, um, you, you can't actually access WeChat as soon as this takes effect because they can't have uh, internet backbone services. And frankly, I, we still don't know. Um, the, the government has in a couple of recent filings, including this one last night, said uh, it would be the latter. It would just make things work less well and eventually drive these services out of business. Um, the, the judge in our lawsuit over the weekend when we had a hearing on Friday, uh, Saturday, uh, discounted those sorts of assertions, which they made then too, because Secretary Ross was quoted on Fox Business News as saying, um, WeChat will be completely shut down as of Monday. And so they essentially took that as an admission by the government that it would be shut down. I, I think the answer, and I, I am not the technical engineer who really can answer the question fully, but my sense from talking to people is that the answer is somewhere in between the two. These services are pretty critical to a lot of the functionality of these apps. And so um, things would work really badly and some things might just stop. But I don't think it's the case that the, the app would, uh, you, you would open up the app and it just wouldn't open that if you already had it on your phone. Got it. So this is really the lay of the land from, I think, the legal perspective of what is at stake right now. I want to turn to Jen. And Jen and I have had extensive conversations um, about what appears to be a sort of muddying of privacy, data security, and national security. Um, not to mention the whole layer of a US-China tech conflict. So Jen, can you help us sort through how do we think about these very distinct but increasingly blurred issues at stake and what are the risks? Um, great, thanks. Thanks, Sam, um, and thanks, um, thanks, David, as well, for this great conversation. Um, before I get there, I just want to add in one additional layer of complication to add on to the, to the litigation issue, which is this question of the potential sale and all the back and forth that's gone on with that. So um, that's another layer of complexity that um, with respect to TikTok, again, as, as Sam, as you rightly pointed out at the beginning there, um, although we're talking about both lawsuits, they raise a whole set of separate equities, legal issues, and also policy issues as well. Uh, but with respect to TikTok, um, there was, um, for one thing, there's been a number of shifting deadlines as to when any sort of ban would go into effect, which has been caught up with this idea that some of this could be dealt with, with, with via a sale. Um, this was first um, kind of came to the attention of, um, of the American people when um, President Trump announced that he would approve a sale of a very American company um, to, to purchase um, TikTok. And for a while, it was presumed that would be Microsoft. Um, that has um, apparently fallen through, and President Trump has has stated that he will approve a sale involving a combination of Oracle and Walmart, although we don't know all the details about um, what that will look like. It looks like it's actually, um, I should say, I should, I should um, be clear, it's not actually an outright sale, but it would be a transaction pursuant to which Oracle and Walmart would take part ownership and a minority ownership, according to at least what's been reported of TikTok, approximately 20%. Um, and so a significant amount of the company would still be owned by Chinese interests. Um, so, um, and another piece of this is that um, Oracle and Walmart officials have also said that they would pay um, $5 billion um, to the United States or to support some sort of um, US based program in, that also kind of falls from President Trump's claim that he was going to demand a tax for this sale, which is a pretty unprecedented um, situation. But that's another piece of this. That's, that's a moving piece of the puzzle. And that transaction, that sale, that shift of ownership will also then go back into the CPS process, which also um, will re we'll have to review whether or not this transaction satisfies the national security concerns that were raised by the CPS process as well. So we've got the litigation, we've got the potential sale, and they all kind of merge together as part of the background. Now to turn to your question, which was about the national security data privacy data security issues. I, mean, I think one of the things that we're seeing here is um, obviously 
um, this, these, these bans were announced on the 6th of August pursuant to AIPA, um, and AIPA requires a finding that there's been an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security foreign policy or economy of the United States. And here, with respect to both the TikTok and the WeChat bans, the national security threat that the president announced were both surveillance concerns and also censorship concerns. And here I think it's very important to kind of unpack what exactly those concerns are. So here, when we're talking about TikTok and WeChat, we're talking about communication tools um, that kind of sit at the kind of highest level of the internet stack. It's a very different situation than when we were dealing with, for example, Huawei, which was in the news a lot over the last few years and in connection with the ban on Huawei. And then you're talking about a company that has access to the infrastructure, to the network. And in that situation, there are, at least in my view, very significant surveillance concerns um, about um, being able to access information that flows basically anywhere across the network. When you get to TikTok and WeChat, um, it's a different set of concerns. It's about collecting surveillance of personal communications. And here, um, and then I'll, I'll stop because we, we can hopefully come back to this. I think there is a, it's important to kind of parse out the different security concerns. There's one set of concerns about getting access to communications about government business, um, of government officials, of people talking about official business. There's a separate set of concerns, which I would argue are more removed from the core national security interests of getting access to communications of Chinese Americans talking to their parents or their grandparents in China or teenagers talking to one another um, on a TikTok app. And I think it's very important as we think through these issues that we disentangle what specific national security concerns we are talking about and when and in what circumstances those are concerns about access to core national security secrets, when they're access about concerns about access to our critical infrastructure, and when they are merging more with kind of general data privacy concerns. And if that's where we're going with our understanding of national security, what are the kind of really big broad implications and does national security then effectively swallow everything? Yeah, can, can I add, I, I agree entirely with what Jen just said. Um, and in fact, uh, it's interesting because the evidence that the government put forth in the WeChat case to date, and they, they threw some new evidence in last night and I'm not yet able to really to even describe that, but we'll get it once I, focused on it. But before that, a lot of the evidence they used was about things like Huawei and, and infrastructure. And then when they they had a little, um, a couple of reports they cited about the security risks of WeChat. Uh, and the suggestions of those people were things like ban the use on government funds. It wasn't ban individuals' uses. Of it. it was be very much more targeted because of the national, the, the, what are the actual security risks. And the one other thing I'll say on this to to reinforce what, what Jen had said was, um, so we have, I think it's seven different actual plaintiffs. So we had a bunch of plaintiffs putting in declarations and in some of those declarations, they talked about the fact that they understood that, that their communications, especially their communications back to China, not intra-US communications with other members of the Chinese community, our community um, might be um, surveilled in some way. And they didn't like that fact, and they but they used the app knowing that because of its value to them, its value as a means of communication um, with family in China and such. So it was a it was a conscious choice to allow themselves to have some level of uh, surveillance by the system, but, which frankly is no different than all of our choice to use Facebook, which is similarly heavily surveilled by the company and subject to all sorts of surveillance request by the U.S. and state governments. So I'm going to put on my James Mulvenon hat and also my former working with the national security community hat to really dig deeper into, you know, what's at stake here. Um, and I think the comparison between WeChat and Facebook doesn't entirely hold up. 
Um, if we think about WeChat is known to be, a, you know, a sort of constant real-time monitoring by Chinese authorities. Um, and if there are data requests made on WeChat, um, there are no real meaningful avenues for contestation in a rule-by-law country. Um, I think from the TikTok perspective, you know, there was a, an, an op-ed in the Washington Post earlier this week laying out um, two distinct national security risks, which I happen to disagree with, but I think we're, are very, a very clear articulation because I think sometimes that hap what happens with TikTok is we say, why is a video of someone lip singing with their cat of national security value? Is this, this is a, this is a, a privacy person, this is a privacy issue. Um, and if someone wants to monetize that, if this is, has a, because we know that TikTok has a very powerful algorithm um, and can get users hooked on the app um, to spend more time on the app so more data is funneled in and then with that powerful algorithm um, the company can then seed content which can manipulate behavior um, and what this washington post article identified were two risks one is that algorithm you know, the better it gets, the more data that's fueled into that algorithm and it gets more refined. What's to say that in China's military civil fusion system, that algorithm is not gonna get better at targeting a missile. It's the idea of more users, let's fire a missile. Um, number two is the idea of, you know, if we know that, if I think one of the murky issues around TikTok, and this is separate, I think, from the data security issue, but one of the more murky issues around TikTok has been, you know, what is the way in which that algorithm boosts certain content um, over others. And we know that there have been cases, per, for example, around, you know, there was a user who was curling her eyelashes while talking about Xinjiang. And then her account was sort of mysteriously deactivated, apparently, according to a technical glitch. Um, I think now in this environment, it would be very hard for TikTok to remove content about Xinjiang, right? But we do know that there's some murkiness around what kind of content is coming out and the degree of influence that the Chinese government may or may not have with that algorithm. Um, my view of what's wrong with those two national security arguments, and then would love to hear your, your perspective, is the algorithm is powerful as a tool of boosting content and seeding content, which is a totally distinct set of issues for let's target a missile for an autonomous you know, weapon system. Um, it's quite far-fetched and I think there's an exaggeration around the extent to which the military civil fusion um, is so pervasive and effective within the Chinese bureaucracy. James may have uh, may have some, you know, may just challenge me on that perspective, but that's my view. Um, and on the second one around, you know, are we that fragile as a system that we are, are the U.S. government is going to crumble because of Chinese communist propaganda? You know, I, I think given, I, I think a, a, your average TikTok user, if they were fed Chinese prom, communist propaganda, would probably just delete the app. I mean, the whole point is to feed people things that they actually want to see to get them hooked. Um, and we know that while Russia has been very sophisticated in the ways that it has seeded misinformation into the system, everything that we know about the way China conducts these overseas information operations is much more, one, heavy-handed, and two, about Chinese domestic issues. Can you influence the way that dissidents are talking about things like Hong Kong and the South China Sea um, and those sorts of issues? And Uyghurs and things and like that. Uyghurs, exactly. Um, anyway, that was a long sort of dip into the national security side, but you, any responses, either Jen or David, on those points? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think there's, there are really important aspects of this conversation. So I think when we talk about the national security issues, there are really three. There was one, the, the claim, the AI claim, which applies to TikTok, not WeChat, and I share your skepticism and again, I'm not, I'm not um, a, a technology, I'm, I'm not a tech expert, I'm not a technologist, but having spoken to many people who work in AI, I think there's, um, I, I've been told that my skepticism about this idea that just because you get access to data and just because you have developed an AI tool in one context necessarily translates to a different context is that, that your, your skepticism is apt, that it's very, it's very real. And so I share your, your skepticism about the AI point. The second one is the surveillance issue. And then again, to go back, I mean, I think we have to distinguish who's being surveyed and for what purposes. And when, you know, the argument there, the national security argument there is that 
even if we're not talking about government officials, even accessing data about ordinary individuals, there's the capacity to influence in ways um, that um, may in some cases provide some sort of, of, of concern, threat, et cetera. And again, that, that may be true, but here we also have really big equities on the other side. And so I think we need to think through both what is the seriousness of any national security claim and, and, and think about that in connection with, especially with WeChat and also with TikTok, the free speech implications on the other side. And then finally, there's the censorship issue. And I think it's, you know, if you're gonna take the national security perspective, it's more than just the censorship of the kind of human rights censorship issue, which is a real concern, but it's harder to say that that's necessarily a national security concern. Um, I think the bigger threat is one that would be associated with concerns about election influence. And Sam, you're right that China has been a lot less sophisticated historically than Russia with re regard to election influence. But I think that that is, that is the claimed concern. And again, the question is, what do you do about it? And is, is that is the risk that there's some sort of influence justify the entire ban of an entire app? And particularly, again, once you balance the other equities at stake, um, um, I think there's some serious concerns about that approach. I want to get back. Can, to I, can, I, can, oh, can I add two points on that before no, you? Go ahead. Uh, and the first, I mean, because on the, the last point, I think, it, it, I mean, it, obviously, sort of foreign influence in our political discourse and other forms of discourse is a big deal. Uh, but it, in some ways, it shows the lie to these bands because um, as both of you have suggested, the real problem has been apparently has been sort of Russian mostly influence and disinformation campaigns. And most of that's been on Facebook and Twitter. It's not on WeChat or, or TikTok. And so if that, if this concern about foreign influence and, and foreign um, disinformation campaigns were really what was going on here, and now I'm speaking in my litigation hat about sort of challenging what's really going on here and whether this is all really about a bunch of kids organizing on TikTok to pretend to appear at a, a Trump rally. Um, but if this was really about the national, the, the disinformation campaigns in the US, then why are we focused just on WeChat and TikTok? Why aren't we, 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 we thinking also very seriously about the regulation of Facebook, Twitter, other things? And then you get into all the constitutional and other questions about this. Um, but it, it seems like a, a solution to the wrong problem. And the other thing I, I will flag, because you, um, Sam, you had made this point about, so people don't know about the surveillance and such, but, and, and obviously the government would say, my answer is sort of off point, but the US government does exactly the same thing. I mean, the US government routinely brings subpoenas to cloud providers and um, sort of other internet service providers for material about uh, individuals with uh, under, uh, theories and under statutes which doesn't require any notice to those people. So yes, China is, the US government would say, but we're concerned about the foreign interference in our case, but, but we do the same thing. So it's a little hard to push that. I mean, I think there's just no way possibly to compare law enforcement access to data in China with law enforcement access to data in the US system. I mean, Jen, can you help us? What is, how should we think about these, you know, what is the process by which the, that, how does that work in the US? Is David's point fair that that is that an accurate comparison? So I don't, I mean, I don't think that the, that the, I mean, I, I think that there's clearly the access to data concerns in China are significantly greater than the access to data concerns in the United States. And in the United States, the, the, the bigger concern is, is a lack of significant, meaningful, any meaning, really meaningful consumer privacy protections. And that's, um, you know, if, if we're going to go down the road of talking about the real problems here, the underlying problems here about malicious foreign interference, and also data security, data privacy, I mean, I think that there's a whole set of issues that the US needs to tackle that have nothing to do with Chinese based companies or Chinese based apps that really would go a long way to providing the kinds of protections that are needed. But um, you know, I think it's also quite clear that um, that the U.S. law enforcement is subject to a very robust number of constraints and rules with respect to access to data in ways that just 
do not exist in China and anything comparable um, or even close. It's a cheap point, I will admit it. Although, and I will say, you know, coming from me, I've done a ton of work looking at the evolution of China's data protection system. So it's, it's, it's funny that this argument is coming from me, right? Because we know that China has actually moved rapidly in putting in place, at least in writing, laws and regulations and standards that do actually attempt to put some guardrails in writing. Um, I would argue that those guardrails are more meant as a check from a consumer privacy standpoint as far as what companies are able to do with data. At the same time, you have massive uh, surveillance authorities given to the government to do what it wants, right? And then there's a question about, you know, is there transparency? Is there meaningful avenues for oversight and contestation, even as we're seeing the rollout of those laws and rules in China? Um, but I want to pivot more to this point about the lack of, me of, of federal privacy law in the U.S., because oftentimes one of the arguments that comes up is this idea of reciprocity, the idea that, well, China banned Google and Facebook and TikTok, and they have the great firewall. So now it makes sense that the U.S. government should finally wake up to the reality that an open, free internet is an illusion um, and just give China a taste of its own medicine here. The, there are a couple of problems with that argument. Um, one of which is I think the way to actually truly technically be reciprocal would actually be to pass federal privacy law or have at least a set of clear country agnostic criteria that TikTok and WeChat and others would be subject to. And then if they're unable to comply with those, then they're banned for them from the market. So that's actually what it would look like if it was true reciprocity. Um, the other, of course, is you know, China is a lot of things that I think probably we sh are not a good idea to mimic. Um, and to Jen's point about, well, what are the equities at stake? If we go down this path, what is the purpose of reciprocity? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and what are the equities at stake if we do do this? And we talked um, about sort of the precedent that this could potentially set. And the Oracle TikTok deal, I think, sets a precedent for industrial policy and the ability of the U.S. government to interfere, requiring uh, a, you know, a, a domestic company to take a stake in exchange for market access, which in my mind just legitimizes China's model because that's what's required for U.S. firms to operate in China. So anyway, that's a lot to throw out there. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, David, you look like you wanted to hop in and say something. Oh, I mean, I, I just, <laughs> I mean, I agree with everything you just said, but I mean, it feels very much like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We have a situation where um, China has a whole bunch of policies, the, the firewall among them, that are fundamentally inconsistent with what we and American civil libertarians and technologists think is the, and should be the nature of the internet. And our response to that shouldn't be to similarly um, to just destroy what the internet has been and what has led it to, to being such a great success and such a huge um, instrument of change in sort of the world over the last two, three decades. Jen, can I put you on the spot for a moment to talk about the project that you're going to be doing at New America this year? Because I think it really feeds into this issue of how do we address some of the real challenges right now in what a U.S. internet governance model should look like in ways that actually are much bigger than this U.S.-China spat? Um, sure. Before I do that, I just want to um, go back to the conversation because I got, um, I, I received, as we were talking, I received a comment, which is a fair one from um, an audience member about the ways in which we are kind of under, underselling the scope of potential China influence in the, in the information space. And that, um, you know, pointing out that Russia has been better than China doesn't, doesn't predict the future and China is getting increasingly more sophisticated and increasingly effective in the information space and it is and 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 the concern is that Chinese that the Chinese government is using its technology tools and its communication systems to spread its message and to use um, to engage in information conflict in a in a more sophisticated um, potentially dangerous way um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that point and and um, I, I that being said, the question still remains, what do we do about that? And, and do we think that a complete ban on the apps is the right response to that? And um, there I have a, ring, a number of very significant questions and concerns. Uh, but going back to your initial question about 
um, what my project is, it's, uh, it's exactly that. It's looking at the ways in which, um, you know, we have, um, you know, it was, it was just a little over a decade or coming in all, in 11 years that um, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton gave her kind of famous free and open internet agenda speech in the new museum here in Washington DC where, where I am currently and kind of promised this very utopian world of what in which the internet would connect us all and we would be free and open and 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 the best voices would be lifted up and contrasted that with the authoritarian model which in which there was an assumption that the authoritarian model um, was was obviously wrong normatively but also would lead to slow and poor economic growth and was on the demise while the free and open internet agenda was on the rise and what we've seen in the last decade is just this enormous amount of harms that are being perpetuated online from all kinds of sources. Um, some of this in the in the information conflict space, but a whole range of areas beyond that. And in the course of responding to that, we in the United States across the world, we are increasingly adopting tools, techniques, practices that were once kind of condemned and associated with authoritarian regimes. And I think my project is, is both mapping that out and also thinking through what are the stopping points. And this goes back to a comment that I think both of you made, but David just said quite forcefully, which is we don't, we, we should not be looking to China as the model to be mimicking. And so the arguments that I've heard over and over again in the wake of the TikTok and the WeChat bans is, we're not stopping free speech. It was China who did it. It was China who kicked out all those companies. And so if China just let in Facebook, if China just let in our communication tools, then Chinese Americans would be able to communicate with their family and friends in China. It's China's fault, not ours. But we are start, the reality is that we are starting at this baseline where um, for reasons that are not at all ideal, those companies have not been allowed to operate in China. And at least they've not been allowed to operate in a way that's consistent with um, with with core values and freedoms. And um, and so this is the world we live in. And by saying they've done it, so we we're going to do it too. We are starting from the status quo in 2020, and that really does cut off communications for a significant part of the population in the name of trying to mimic a country who's engaging in a range of practices that I think we ought to be quite concerned about. Yeah, and, and can I going add? Back to, oh, just to say real, real quick, going to the original executive order on I ICT supply chain executive order that this is based on, if you look at the language of this, it identifies, it gives the Commerce Department vast authority to ban any transaction the quote unquote digital economy. What does that actually mean? And I think that is why what Jen is talking about, why this this is a tool that once you know unleashed, I think has far more um, potentially destructive ramifications than maybe even the users of that anticipated. But say, go ahead. David, do you want to jump in? Okay, sure. The, um, yeah. What. So I guess this is also response to what you just said, but um, so it was more responsive to, to, to something that Janet just said, which is, I mean, I think the, the two words that have not been mentioned once yet in our conversation in the 40 minutes we've been talking is First Amendment. And so, I mean, I think it's important. So if you think, take a, the, the supply chain executive order, the, the national emergency on the supply chain, that does apply so so vastly broadly. It covers everything. And when it was issued, I think many of us thought it was really about supply chain. It was about Huawei and other sorts of um, the um, internet infrastructure that could, that, uh, could very well be a uh, sort of backdoor for sort of James Bond-esque spying. Um, but uh, you then jump from there to WeChat and TikTok, which are communicative media on which people uh, themselves are talking and they're using it to, um, for everything from um, putting up stupid videos to, to having deep discussions of, sort of politics and other things. And th that's where, 
as I've always understood it, in our constitutional system, the, you draw lines between Huawei, and, and I don't know enough about the technical aspects of Huawei to know whether it, Huawei should be banned or not. I'm not using them as a, as a bugaboo in the sense that they're bad. I'm just using them in the sense of uh, they are the kind of equipment that if there were real security risks, I would understand how we would want to ban it from TikTok and WeChat, which just seems so fundamentally different and seem to, to raise such higher constitutional values in the United States that uh, are why we have um, Secretary Clinton talking about the, the, the vast open internet and such, because we are a country that believes in um, communicative uh, speech and believes in sort of the freedom of the press, the freedom of, of, um, of individuals to um, communicate as they see fit. So if we want to go back to this question of how do we address these legitimate concerns in a smart way, in a way that's consistent with the, the openness of the, the US, an open US internet, open, an, an open and free internet that the US government has long lobbied for. How do we do that? And one of the questions, and I want to just remind our, our audience members, please submit questions via the Q&A feature, and we'll use the remainder of the discussion actually to take your questions. So we have a question um, from Tara Hairston, and she, she asks about this need for vendor agnostic criteria. Um, what would be those criteria and that many of the developments we're talking about really do appear to have to be based on country of origin and the legal regimes in a vendor's country of origin. So what would be some ideas? Um, I'll go to you, Jen, for how, what would the criteria be to assess both from a privacy, I mean, from a privacy standpoint, from a cybersecurity standpoint, and potentially these shouldn't be wrapped up in one. And the Chinese uh, cybersecurity law, privacy and cybersecurity are both part of the same law. Um, but how would you put in place these kinds of criteria? What should that, what's a vision for how that would look? Right. So, so great question. And I don't, just to be clear, I don't think that the data privacy, data security, um, I, mean, I, I think that there is a real need for strong data privacy, data security protections. I don't think that in and of itself solves the, the separate problem of foreign ownership and potential foreign access by a country or an entity that we're concerned about. So I just want to make clear that I think it's a piece of the problem, but it's not an entire solution. And, and the other thing I want to say before I answer your question, which is a great question, is, um, you know, we, we keep on talking about the, I mean, I, my, the whole premise of this project that I'm, that I'm kind of embarking on is to be quite skeptical of even the language free and open. Like, I don't think we can have, I mean, free and open to the extent at least free means unfettered. Unfettered is not free. And we've learned that the hard way over the last 10 years. So the question is, how do we construct an internet agenda that matches our values, um, that recognizes that we can't have an unfettered communication network because that leads to so much harm without also at the same time kind of mimicking this, these authoritarian approaches that have been put in place um, and that a range of countries and entities are now adopting as well. So just want to put out there with respect to the rhetoric. In terms of what a good data privacy or data security um, system would look like. I mean, we could spend, you know, multiple, multiple webinars just talking about that. But at a minimum, I think some of the things that we ought to be concerned about are limitations on retention of data, protections against sharing of data for purposes beyond which for which it was collected, um, question limitations on who has access to the data, which is related to the dissemination, um, strong protections in terms of when government can access data, um, strong protections in terms of, um, you know, again, the, the sharing of data, strong security pr protocols in terms of how data is, is stored, um, and a range, and then there's a range of other technical tools themselves that companies and entities can put in place, including encrypting data, including encrypting data end-to-end -end that also um, significantly, obviously, bolster data protection and data security. I, I think that this is such an important idea of how do we have security in an interconnected environment as well. Um, and I, I love, I think, as a, a former CIA official, Sue Gordon, has talked about the idea of having security in, in recognizing that we're going to connect to an untrustworthy network. And what are the ways we can create security within that? David, did you want to chime in on that or, or broader? Um, okay. No, I'm going to let you and, and Jen have that part of the discussion because I'm not. 
not nearly as expert as either of you on it. Okay. Um, and a reminder again to the audience, please submit Q&A and we'll try to get to your questions in the remaining um, part of the hour. Um, Jen, can I, while I'm waiting for other audience questions to come in, can I press you a little bit further on your point about that privacy law is just one part of the picture and that there are things that actually would be country specific or would address, I think, the geopolitical reality that we're, that we're talking about here. Can you speak a bit more further about what your, your thoughts are on that? Yeah, so I, I, I don't know that I was, um, I, I don't know that there's other country specific issues, but my point was simply that if, you know, a data privacy, data security laws would help. So if limitations on how long data is retained, limitations on who can access it, limitations that would apply to the US government um, and, and US officials, um, the, the, the issue is, and this gets into the, the question about extraterritoriality and in what circumstances these rules apply um, extraterritorially and whether and to what extent it's appropriate to put in bans on transfers of data. So the rules would apply clearly if there were a strong data protection regime in the United States that would set limits on retention sharing data storage within the United States. It doesn't necessarily, depending on how the rules are set up, it doesn't necessarily protect against foreign governments also themselves accessing data, um, particularly if data is moved um, either overtly or, or surreptitiously across borders. Um, and you know, one thing that I've been thinking about as we look at, you know, where is the role? At what point do we focus specifically on issues related to China, and at what point do we focus on this is a U.S. internet governance question, and where do those intersect? One of the challenges that I've had, and I don't know the answer to this, so it's okay if you don't either. But in talking about having country agnostic criteria. Wouldn't that just by default mean a ban on sharing data with China? Because would it ever be possible for China for Chinese companies to meet those criteria, even if we know, for example, that under the cybersecurity law regime in China, there are provisions around consent, um, things that are taken from GDPR, which look rhetorically similar to GDPR, but if we also know that there is a lack of meaningful contestation and oversight related to how that's implemented in China, would it ever be possible for a Chinese company to meet that higher threshold, say hypothetically, we had in place those kinds of criteria in a country agnostic way? Um, how do you think about that? I mean, this thing gets back to, this then gets us into the, I mean, I think this, starts to take us into the Schrems GDPR territory, which is the question as to whether and in what circumstances um, government should be putting in place limitations on the transfer of data out of their countries to other countries based on some set of data security, data privacy principles. Um, and the US has not in, in any sort of broad brushed way, I mean, we're starting to do that again in this very kind of ad hoc, let's, let's address TikTok, let's address WeChat, let's address Huawei way, but we have not done that in any sort of broad brush way in the way that the, U, that the U, EU has with respect to their GDPR. I, you know, I am also skeptical that that's a, a good, that the GDPR approach is a good approach. I mean, I think that you, as a result, the, the GDPR, in my opinion, has, has overreached in their restrictions on data transfers. And if countries around the world started adopting that approach, we are in a world where um, any company that wants to operate internationally basically has to build a server in every single part of the world and store data locally. And it becomes incredibly hard to do a whole range of like ordinary business functions like move around HR data, for example, is just a very simple example. So um, you know, this, this set of issues is, is incredibly complicated and the question as to whether and in what circumstances it's appropriate to place limitations on the movement of data either outside of borders kind of writ large or to specific countries i think requires a lot more thought and and discussion yeah yeah and uh, and on this uh, i mean just to, to bring it a little closer back to sort of we check TikTok, i think it's also um it's worth thinking through carefully what data you're talking about. So for, for in these cases where the interest is, 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 has been described as national security, um, you, have to, you have to think about 
what data is actually a national security risk rather than a risk of personal personal privacy, personal data intervention. And so um, this is why the, the Australian um, Institute on which the government has relied repeatedly to defend these uh, these particular bans has suggested much more targeted um, bars on government use and sort of government employee use and things like that to ensure that any data that leaks through um, WeChat or, or is surveilled through WeChat and, and TikTok is um, not a, as doesn't have as high national security implications as others. And obviously, this doesn't get to the broader um, civil society questions of um, should we insist that companies uh, protect all data and sort of set ourselves up as an example of the perfect internet, even if it means cutting off the rest of the world. Um, but so speaking, of, speaking of the rest of the world here, we have a question from Wen Chi Yu. How much do you think other countries, especially our allies, will follow the US lead in banning TikTok and WeChat or taking certain measures to ensure data security based on national security concerns? If the West does form an alliance taking a stance on big Chinese tech companies, what impact is that for the internet? Are we trending toward a bifurcated world? So um, I think, yes, we're trending towards a bifurcated world. I think, you know, even where, where in the Huawei ban, the U.S. was not particularly, has not been successful in getting all of its friends and allies to, to kind of follow suit with that. And there, the national security case is um, a lot stronger. I mean, it's very strong with the Huawei ban. So, so, so I, you know, whether or not the U.S. at this particular moment would be successful in getting everyone to kind of follow suit um, I, I have serious questions about, but I actually think one of the bigger questions that this kind of approach takes, and this is one of the, the real concerns with saying, well, China did it, so we should do it too, is that it, it does normalize this idea that you kick out an app or you kick out some sort of communication tool based on who, what foreign ownership. And you know, there's lots of places around the world where the United States is not particularly popular. And it's not helpful for US companies to be in a world in which the precedent is that foreign governments who for whatever reason are dis disgruntled, dissatisfied, unhappy with the United States, concerned about US surveillance powers, kick out our US companies owned apps um, because we've normalized that as a means of addressing these really important data privacy, data security, surveillance side of questions. Yeah, I think that's precisely right. I mean, uh, I mean, the example from a few years ago that I've uh, I always paid attention to is, I mean, Turkey blocked uh, Wikipedia or, and, and on it because there was too much stuff that the, the government of Turkey didn't like. That, to my mind, was a foreign policy um, issue that needed to be addressed through the traditional foreign policy routes. And we had all sorts of tools to um, affect pressure on countries that do things that that are not, that we think are uh, against our national interest or against the world um, sort of order. But the answer wouldn't be to um, say, okay, you're gonna block Wikipedia, we're gonna block, we're not gonna let any American company sort of do any business with, with Turkey. That's just, that, it, it's not the appropriate response. And, and so, so to here, I think, and this is essentially what Jen just, just said, I mean, using um, as a response, a means that just, continues to um, create sort of a hybridized, bastardized internet around the world with, without the, its traditional openness just makes the problem worse. We have one more question before the hour from Carmen Lucero, my colleague at Yale Law School's Paul Tai China Center. What kind of enforcement mechanisms do you envision for a privacy or data protection law? If we did have such a law, how would we know that Facebook is following it or Tencent? And I wanna just piggy on, piggyback on that question, which is if, if part of the TikTok Oracle deal is to look open, is to have open up the algorithm, is looking at the algorithm one time, a sort of frozen instance of algorithmic review, does that actually get at some of the issues that we're talking about here um, related to content and information influence? So I would say to your last question, I would say no, that's not gonna be, that's not gonna solve the problem. In terms of enforcement, 
you know, there's there's a lot of different proposals that are that are floating around in terms of a national data protection data privacy statute. And I mean, the big the big kind of question in terms of who are the enforcers are um, does the FTC continue to play a role, a strengthened role, um, or or does the U.S. go down a route which is much more complicated of kind of mimicking what's been done in the EU and creating a separate data protection agencies and new data protection authority, which obviously has the huge hurdles of starting something new and getting something new off the ground. Um, but in terms of what's being discussed right now, those are the kind of two main options that appear to be on the table. Yeah, and on that, I have two, two small points. I, one, I mean, I think uh, if, if people haven't read it, I would um, send them to, there was a, a proposal in, back in August by uh, Tom Wheeler, Paul Verveer, and Gene Kimmelman about creating a new sort of oversight agency that was um, put out by the Harvard Shorenstein Center that I, I think, I mean, I'm not sure I think it's right, but I think it was a fascinating proposal. And the other thing I will say is um, uh, back in 2011, I helped start the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I was the first head of defensive litigation there, defensive and health litigation. And um, starting a new agency isn't that hard. It, it takes work, it takes effort, it takes um, a um, level of commitment by the government to transfer functions there and such. But it was also one of the most fun things I've ever done is try to start a new agency from scratch. And uh, I, I don't think we should think that that's off the table just because, um, oh my God, we're doing something new. It, it, we, we, we did it this decade. And um, yes, there's been all sorts of questions about the precise structure of the CFPB, but uh, it also did, it has done a lot of good. And those, those questions about its structure have prevented it from, in fact, really improving things after the 2009, uh, 2009 class. We're at our, our time. Apologies, we couldn't get to all of our questions, but please continue to reach out. Hopefully we can continue the conversation. Um, I think what's become clear here is that what is at stake is much bigger than a US-China spat, but really the future of how the internet will be governed. So Jen and David, thank you so much for joining us.